everybody. Welcome to the Work World. Uh, we're here to get to know different people from around the world who have different types of jobs, different industries. Uh, we got together to create this show in order to uh, expose the younger generation to the possibilities out there, uh, because sometimes it's difficult to think about what to do or what possibilities are out there until you see some examples. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alvin. Hi, everyone. Alvin Hunt. Yeah. So Alvin, uh, if you don't mind quickly introducing yourself to the group here. Sure. So my name is Alvin. I'm a father of two kids. Um, right now, I'm working at a company, a social media company called LinkedIn. If you have not heard about LinkedIn, it's like a Facebook, but for professionals where people connect on the platform. Uh, and what I do there is um, I kind of lead our insights team uh, across Asia Pack. And so you can think of a team as a, a team of data analysts. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for clarifying what LinkedIn is. Uh, we have a uh, diverse group of uh, kids on board. So yes, it's a social media platform. So we're talking about, you know, re relatively new, uh, you know, to the industries. So uh, for those who've already logged in previously, we've had uh, a slightly different uh, order of things, but today we would like to ask uh, first about his, the work and the industry, and then I'll open the, open, the, uh, open the questions, and then we'll go into schooling skills and the, those type of things, and then again, I'll open it to questions, and then finally, we'll ask any other questions that we might have at the end, okay? Okay, so let, let's go ahead. So uh, Alvin, uh, you shared with us that you worked it with uh, LinkedIn and it's, uh, as mentioned, it's uh, what do you say, a social media platform for work, people to connect from a working front, correct? Uh, and you say you mentioned uh, the data analyst. Can you explain to us what a data analyst is? Sure. So um, as all of you would have known about this term called big data, there's a lot of data out there and um, the amount of data actually requires to do some kind of coding um, to get the data out into meaningful ways where you can analyze it. So our job is basically querying the data from the database, um, analyzing the data through different data models, and then coming up with a story to tell. Because at the end of it, um, what's important is we take the data, we convert it into insights, and we want to use these insights to influence people to make certain decisions. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. So insights are information that you gained uh, from analyzing the data? Exactly. Okay, what kind of things can you learn from the data specifically from LinkedIn? Yep, so to give an example, um, if, you, if any of you have a LinkedIn profile, you would notice that you have your say experiences, you would list certain skills in your profile. Now to, to every member, a skill listed on a profile is a data point to us. And what is um, important for the insights team at LinkedIn is that we can look at the skills of millions of people out there, cut them by industries, cut them by different types of companies. And we can start to realize what kind of skills in aggregate are becoming more and more in demand or what skills are facing kind of a, a gap between maybe there's a very small supply of certain skills, but very big demand of skills from certain companies. And so in aggregate, these are the insights um, that can help companies and governments understand uh, what kind of policies they should be implementing. Okay. When you're collecting this data, do they, does it come in as numbers? How do you actually collect this information? Do you have people who are looking at each profile? How is this data collected? There, there's so much data out there. Um, data where, like you mentioned, um, someone is viewing a company page. Um, you may be viewing a job, um, people connecting with one another. There's so much data points out there. What happens is all of this are kind of stored in, like you said, um, numbers. Uh, it could be unstructured data as well. So it could be in text format. Um, it could be pictures and videos. And there are different ways where you can analyze on different formats of data. Okay, so you said that there's different ways to analyze the data. Can you share with us uh, some ways that you analyze the data? Is it on a spreadsheet, for example? Yep. Um, so you, you probably first have to kind of do some kind of coding. Um, mm -hmm. The different languages out there, um, for example, like structured query language allows you to query data basically it's in, a, in a very unstructured format. You code the data, get it out in a table format, and then you analyze it through, um, again, like there are many different softwares or languages you can use like Python, 
a lot of you would have heard of it, really, really popular language nowadays. They have different packages you can use to analyze the data. Okay, so you are a coder then? Uh, yep, and still learning. Okay, so you mentioned that there's software and coding. Uh, what part portion do you do yourself and what part do you use pre-existing softwares? So if, if I look at, say, um, querying data, um, if you enter a company which has already like all the data sorted out in nice softwares, you can just use the software. Uh, for big data companies like LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, um, all of these are kind of proprietary, meaning that we have our own internal systems because mm -hmm. the volume of data is too big. And this is where then you have to do a, a lot of the work yourself. But then if you're trying to say, um, visualize certain data, uh, put it into graphs and dashboards, there are companies like Tableau, uh, ClickViews, companies out there that have these softwares uh, where your companies have purchased them and you can use them. Okay. Does that mean your whole team are tech people? They, they learn how they can code and they can use technology well? Yep. You know what's the interesting thing? Um, they all know how to use the technology well, but not mm -hmm. all of them came from the background. So we've got okay. people from consulting, we've got people from human resources, and of course, we've got people from technical backgrounds. Um, nowadays, like there's no straight path towards a career. I think it's okay. about what you, you know, how you embrace the learning that's most important. Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned that you yourself are still learning. Uh, have you always had a tech background? I don't. Um, interestingly, my, so I was in Singapore Management University. Um, I studied business, majored mm -hmm. in finance and marketing. So I did a bit of coding back then, um, you know, a bit of pocket money. So I was kind of creating websites uh, on the site for some companies, learning HTML um, really on the site. Mm. That was my only foray into learning, very basic HTML and CSS. Over the years, I kind of um, forgotten the language, but it was, um, you know, when I started to enter into this analytics world, I wanted to relive it again. And so it was a lot of learning um, just on a go. Very cool. So with LinkedIn, you've always been a data analyst? Not really. Um, I, so I joined LinkedIn about eight and a half years ago. Uh, it was a long time ago where they first established the Singapore mm -hmm. office. So really small office. Imagine going for an interview and you see only like 10 people uh, in the office. And I, I actually entered the role of an account analyst. Um, it was a bit of everything, a bit of marketing, a bit of sales, a bit of analyzing data. Um, and I chose that because I wasn't really sure what kind of career I wanted. And so that's how I kind of bumped into LinkedIn. So an accounts analyst is different from a data analyst. It, it is different. Um, one of my clients actually told me, Elvin, you, you are called an account analyst, but you don't really analyze much. Like you are doing, I was doing a lot of sales. I was doing a lot of cold calls, selling into um, my most memorable experience was selling to uh, companies like Samsung. And, you know, you, you, you had to make calls into many different kind of uh, many different countries. Uh, I was doing sales calls to Africa, to Hong Kong, to America, and just getting a lot of cultural experiences, um, which was great. Very cool. So this is uh, so LinkedIn is a relatively new company and uh, you were here. You started with LinkedIn while it was still new here. Well, what's the experience like working for a, uh, you know, kind of a startup, I guess, but a bigger one? Yep. Um, things are not kind of um, structured or thought out well uh, when it comes to a startup. Um, mm -hmm. While we were big at the time, there were five, 6,000 people globally. Uh, but again, in APAC and in Singapore, it was just like 10 people. So um, you see a lot of things which you don't see now. For example, we didn't have enough meeting rooms, simple mm -hmm. things like um, we, we actually had to kick the managing director out of his room um, because we were hiring so fast and we didn't have enough interview rooms. Um, you had things like, you know, billing issues or legal contracts that needed negotiation. And I think at the time it was about being resourceful. It was about mm -hmm. really just taking care of things that don't really fall within your job scope and mm -hmm. just being very quick to learn on, on the go. So it's a lot more uh, unstructured, I guess, the learning? Unstructured, yes. I mean, it's like I, I had to be in charge of, um, say, you know, like in days, uh, which are days where we get together as a team, um, organize like team building activities. Um, we even like the end even give us some money um, to buy an Xbox because there was nothing in the office for leisure at the time. So literally, and then, you know, from sales as well, after selling, who is going to kind of approach the client and help them um, be successful for our pro with our products. If your product had um, certain improvements that needs to be made, you could be calling the product manager in the US. 
So a lot of these things, again, don't really fall in your job scope, um, but that's mm -hmm. what happens when you're in a startup. Oh, fantastic. Okay, we have some questions rolling in, so let me start. Uh, we have a question from TY. What was your most difficult data analysis project? Um, interesting. Let me think about it. There are a couple. Um, I think one of them was um, coming up with uh, a scoring system um, for one of our flagship products called Recruiter. Mm -hmm. So Recruiter essentially is a subscription product where it allows recruiters to use the product to find talent. Mm. Um, and what was happening then, we had hundreds and thousands of users globally, um, but they weren't sure what was the right way to measure whether they were optimizing or effectively using the product. Mm. Okay. And account teams globally were using their own scoring systems to talk to their clients to say that, you know, you're good at using this, uh, this is where you can improve. But the scoring system was so inconsistent globally and salespeople were spending so much time doing their own scoring. And so we actually embarked on one um, a project to create this scoring system where we can use, use it globally. Um, now, the, of course, there is a long process of doing the research, talking to clients, uh, you know, using different methodologies to, to kind of measure it. Mm -hmm. And the tough part was really getting the alignment from everyone globally. You're talking mm -hmm. about multiple functions across multiple uh, countries. Okay. Getting them aligned on one single set of metric that you will be kind of launching to the clients. Okay, um, interesting. So, so most it's, projects it's, would be on the soft skills. Yeah, I was about to say, it doesn't sound much of the coding part that was challenging. It was the soft skills part, uh, communicating and uh, dealing with all their counterparts. Am I correct to say that? Um, for that project, yes. Okay. Okay, we have a question from Linny. Uh, what are your main responsibilities in your job? And I know what, let me extrapolate from that question. Uh, could you also tell us, you know, what a day at work is like? Cool. Um, I can talk about what an insights analyst does uh, mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, you, you could say start work at around eight to nine. Um, it really depends. In tech companies, they're not so stringent on what time you, you start mm -hmm. work and end work. Um, we're mm -hmm. pretty flexible as long as you do your job. So you'll be checking the emails probably for the first hour. Um, and then you could be working on a custom analysis for a client company. Mm -hmm. So this is where you do the coding, query the data, um, analyze the data and put it into a presentation. Mm -hmm. And then after lunch, you could be going to a customer presentation, um, advising the customer um, on what decisions they should be making, presenting the insights that we have seen from our, our data set. Um, and then you go back to office, say, in late afternoon, and you, should, you could be working on a project. So the project could be, say, you know, inventing a, a scoring system or an algorithm or something. And this usually involves like cross collaboration with many different functions. So you, be, you may be in meetings talking to um, different people. Mm -hmm. Then you'll probably have a half an hour, one hour kind of reserve for learning, whether it's learning new technical skills or learning new products um, that your company has launched. And then you could be entering like a, a company all hands uh, mm -hmm. meeting where your CEO is addressing the entire company. And okay. of course, if you work for an American company, there could be night calls as well sometimes. That's true. So it's flexible, but it sounds like you're pretty busy as well. Um, always. Always. But, but fun. Uh, but fun. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we have a lot of questions rolling in. Everybody keep them coming. Uh, we have one question about the coding specifically. If you encounter problems with code, do you Google for the answers? <laughs> um, all the time. <laughs> so we, you know, the, the language versions change all the time. There are mm -hmm. new packages that are being launched. A lot of things are open source. So mm -hmm. I believe whether you're in Google, Facebook, even the best tech companies, uh, mm -hmm. and of course, LinkedIn as well, you are Googling all the time. Mm -hmm. There are different ways where you can look for code answers, right? And of course, Stack Overflow is probably the most popular. Okay. So uh, can you clarify for not, not everyone here is probably a coder. Well, what does open source and what's Stack Overflow? Um, so Stack Overflow is kind of like a forum where mm -hmm. people are asking questions and you see a lot of people posting uh, answers for those questions. And it's typically used by developers and coders. Uh, would you recommend this as a resource for people who are learning the code then? Uh, yes, of course. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to keep on going. And when it comes to academic qualifications, is a poly diploma sufficient or one has to further their education to, pr to pursue tertiary education. I think uh, Zachary is asking this question in relation to working as a data analyst. Mm. I mean, to be honest, 
we don't really discriminate. And I think a lot of companies are starting to not really ask or look at qualifications as much. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, nowadays, they tend to ask more of, um, you know, have you entered any competitions? Mm -hmm. um, can you show me your Git repository? And mm -hmm. basically, this is where you kind of store your code and projects um, mm -hmm. for a lot of coders. So they want to see projects that you've done uh, or semblances of, um, you know, experiences or projects you've done that could kind of um, show that you could mm -hmm. do part of the work. Okay, so the Git repository is like a portfolio for your code, am I right? Uh, it is, it is. And there okay. are people who, you know, in Tableau as well, for example, there's a mm -hmm. public gallery where people publish um, dashboards based on public data. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are many ways to kind of showcase a profile today. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's keep on going. Uh, from Chi Sing, uh, how do you ensure you, your analysis, hmm? you analyze the data in the right way? So how do you know if it's correct or not? If I know. Ooh. Mm. Um, very simple question, but um, I don't think there is one easy answer to this. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my team deals with analysis of talent data. And if mm -hmm. you look at, say, data analysis, it has made a lot of foray into marketing, um, yeah. into IoT, but not so much into HR. Mm -hmm. And so we often realize that we are drawing a lot of um, similarity, similarities or analogies or methodologies from other industries and applying mm -hmm. it to our world. And there isn't really a you know, gold, golden answer as to this is the right way. Yeah. But I think it depends on what the assumptions um, and what question you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is using logic, a lot of testing, um, mm -hmm. getting different views to get in. And that's why diversity of opinions is so important in the team. Okay. So it's uh, still a little bit of trial and error, I assume? Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. Of course, it depends on the kind of project. If you are working on predictive analytics, um, obviously, you can actually test like accuracy and so on. Mm -hmm. But again, even that is sometimes subjective because mm -hmm. uh, different data sets could give you different uh, results. Okay. We have a question uh, that flows very well into this. Uh, do you all have to come up with the measuring metrics or do the sales team share with you what to measure? How long do you all take to finish one project? I think let's separate those into two, uh, two sides. Uh, first is the measuring metrics. How do you come up with them? And are other teams involved in that process? Right. It's a great question, mm -hmm. um, especially when you mention about sales, because this is usually what happens. And I don't think it's just data analysts. Uh, I think it's in any job. Mm -hmm. Someone will come to you with a request, right? And you often realize that that request, um, there is a lot of questions underneath and that may not be the root question that you want to solve. So a lot of times a salesperson could come to say that this metric is important, but when we start digging deeper and talking to the client, there is actually something else that they want to solve for. So it is really about, firstly, it's really about the customer and not about your solution or the salesperson's um, request. It's really about the customer. And then really digging deep to understand what problem you're trying to solve before you come up with a solution. Fantastic. Okay, for the next part of the question, uh, thank you, Shermaine, by the way. Uh, how long do you all take to finish one project? If I, I'm sure there's different types of project, but on average, uh, you know, are we talking days, weeks, or even years? What, kind of, what are the projects you work on? It, like? it ranges. Uh, for my team, we do a lot of custom analyses for companies. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, it's, I'm not sure if it's even considered a project, but a customer could come to say, I want to know what skills are emerging in my industry. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, two days, three days kind of analysis. Um, it could be, like I said, we were coming up with a metric that we will launch um, globally. That could take six months. Mm -hmm. um, so it really ranges from, say, a few days to six months, depending on the project. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. We have, we're actually, you know, it's, we're going to go into the next part where we're going to talk about skills, schooling, and all that, because we have a few questions already in that uh, direction. Uh, you know, before we start that, do you mind uh, telling us, you know, your background in terms of your schooling, uh, both uh, formal and informal, and, you know, just how you brought yourself to this point? Um, where do I start from? Uh, you know what, uh, since, you know, we, how about we start from the secondary school, because I think we have a lot of secondary school kids here. Uh, just share with us what kind of student you were and, you know, go from there. Cool. Um, wow, I, I actually enjoyed my secondary school days. Um, so I was in um, Chinese High. I think it was called mm -hmm. the Chinese High School. It probably changed names now to Hua Chong Institution or something. Um, oh, Hua Chong. Mm -hmm. And so I was there and 
I think there were a lot of good memories there. Uh, I was in scouts. So mm -hmm. I was a scout and I don't know why, but as part of the scouting days, you also had to be in lion dance. So I was kind of mm -hmm. um, in two different CCAs. Um, I, I must say, I, was, I think I was a pretty good student in the first two years. And then my results kind of crashed um, quite a bit in, in the third and fourth year, probably because I was playing too much football. Um, after that, I kind of went to uh, Anderson Junior College, um, mm -hmm. where I studied like econs, math, um, the usual. Um, I dropped chemistry in my, in my second year because I, I realized that, you know, sciences wasn't really my thing. Although it's funny because now I'm back into kind of, um, you can consider coding um, a bit of science as well. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, of course, to army and then to, to university in SMU. Um, and I picked SMU because I, I love I like doing projects mm -hmm. or rather maybe I wasn't as confident in doing exams and I knew there was a heavier weightage towards projects. Um, so there I was, and I took business cause to be honest, like I, I don't really know what I wanted to do right then. Um, and business was kind of general enough for me to mm -hmm. consider. Okay. Let me rewind back. You said that you, uh, you were a great student the first two years and later on, you know, you've, uh, it, it started to, you know, go downhill a little bit. Was that, uh, in retrospect, was that a big deal? It, it was a big deal uh, then as well, because mm -hmm. I remember, like, I, I had an episode with my dad where I was really angry with him and so on. Uh, he was angry with me because mm -hmm. I didn't do well in my third year. And I was going for um, President Scout Award, uh, which would require a lot of commitment in my co-curricular mm -hmm. co activities. Um, and so, yeah, there, there were kind of decisions that you had to make and so on. But in the end, I went for it. And like to me, CCA, like my scouting days were, was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I do feel mm -hmm. that a lot of soft skills that I have today were really kind of built back on that foundation for mm -hmm. my scouting days in, in secondary school. Okay. So the CCA uh, had a role in your, your growth then? It wasn't just the academics? No, it wasn't. Well, the academics was important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned that in high school or uh, JC, you dropped science, but later you became a science person. Is, is yeah. that something that you regret doing in retrospect or is, was that you know, just part of uh, your journey? Um, I think it's just part of my journey. Um, even till now, if you ask me, will I still be involved in analytics like 10 years from now um, or even five years from now, I, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. know. Um, to me, life is an adventure. Um, we have kind of 40 years to work, right? From 20 plus to 60 plus. And, you know, take your time to figure out um, is it an adventure because you never know what you're going to do the next year or, you know, that there are full of surprises that are waiting for us. So I think the important thing is to embrace learning mm -hmm. and embrace uh, what's to come. Okay, I'm going to go start going into some of the questions. Uh, is there anything you regret not doing? You mean at LinkedIn? Uh, it can be at LinkedIn or it can be your, your journey up until you join LinkedIn. Hmm. How well, about let's make it more specific. How yeah. about from a uh, skills, growth, uh, experience point of view that you think that maybe you would have benefited if you uh, partook? Yep. Um, well, I definitely would love to have um, taken more, more programming or coding kind of um, mm -hmm. academic classes um, earlier on. I think that would really help. Um, I also think the ability to communicate is important. And I have seen quite a few of my friends who, you know, have taken speech and drama classes. And this has really kind of aided them in the career. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another kind of skill that, you know, I would love to have. Okay, drama. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Would you do it now? Um, actually, I, I, would, I would consider, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what do you think aided you most in getting your job at LinkedIn, I suppose? Mm -hmm. So, well, this is eight and a half years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know what? At that I, point, so at that point, uh, so, sorry, did you go straight into LinkedIn after you're graduating or did you have experience before that? I had experience before that. So mm -hmm. um, I graduated in 2009. Um, mm -hmm. Most of you wouldn't have faced that, but it was a financial crisis. Yeah. Um, at that time, everyone in SMU wanted to go to the banks to start mm -hmm. working, but none of the banks were really hiring. So I applied for obviously the banks and also Singapore Tourism Board. Uh, I mm -hmm. got in there, worked there for two years. After that, I realized that um, that's 
kind of not what I wanted to do. Um, and so I left, I went to US for a one month road trip, came back and then started applying for jobs. And I was actually using different platforms, including LinkedIn to find a job. And that's how mm. I found out about the job at LinkedIn. Um, to answer your question, like how I got the, the job at LinkedIn, um, I remember this story um, very vividly because it was the, I think it was a deciding factor for, for me in getting into LinkedIn. So it was my last interview. I went into the room, sat down, greeted the interviewer, and then the interviewer said, all right, Alvin, you can start now. And I was like, start what? Um, and I realized then that I wasn't briefed on what I was going to do. So the interviewer went out to ask the recruiter, came back and, oh, we forgot to give you the case. And the case was, I was supposed to prepare a you know, five minute pitch um, to try to sell LinkedIn solutions to him as a, as a mock-up um, customer. And luckily, I was watching a lot of videos the night before. So mm -hmm. I was kind of prepared going in, but I wasn't prepared to do a full pitch. So it gave me mm -hmm. five minutes to get my thoughts together and, and I did the pitch. Um, and I think what's really surprising was that I really wasn't prepared for it, but yet I seemed prepared for it. Because you didn't have the assignment and yet you prepared for all the possibilities, it sounds like. Yep. Oh, fantastic. Uh, we have a question. Uh, is, there a, is there any learning or reading resources or magazines you would recommend for someone considering to follow the same career path as you? Um, I wouldn't... There's a lot of websites um, mm -hmm. towards data science is one of them. Um, I think more importantly is the continual learning. So there are mm -hmm. so many different um, learning platforms out there. LinkedIn Learning is one of them where you can mm -hmm. take courses on different types of learning platforms. Um, obviously, there are other vendors like Data Camp that are mm -hmm. just focused on data analytics. So okay. you, you got to keep learning because the, the world of data analytics and the world of coding is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So you, uh, it's interesting that you took that break in between. Do you think that was a good use of your time after your time at the Singapore Tourism Board? I think it was a good use. Um, for me, I wanted to kind of reset. Um, you know, when you're in a job, oftentimes like after months or years, like you tend to be bogged down by certain legacies and so on. And mm -hmm. you want to kind of reset your mind and think about where you want to go next in your career. And like I said, life is an adventure. So different people have different take, right? And for me, I was willing to take the risk. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I wanted to kind of embrace the unknown in front of me. So for me, it, it really worked out. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you learned uh, during your stint there? Um, your stint that you mean crazy? Uh, was it, uh, you said one month in the US, if I'm right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, number one, I uh, never spent so much time in US before that. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, learned a lot of like just possibilities in the US. Uh, you know, when you go to Vegas and you see like all these big hotels and so on, it really opens up your eyes um, into, you know, what the world is like and what mm -hmm. you could achieve and what people have achieved. Um, so just getting that exposure to me was priceless. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So in terms of uh, your experience uh, going into LinkedIn, you mentioned that first you were at, uh, what was it, uh, accounts analyst and now a data analyst, but your academic background seems to, at least the tertiary was in business. Uh, yeah. in, in terms of that, do you use those skill sets now? Um, yes, I do. You mean, do I use the business skill sets? The business skills, my... things that you learned at SMU. Got, got it. Um, all the time, actually. Okay. Whether you're in a technical role or not, um, you know, this soft skills and business skills are so important. Um, in fact, as a data analyst, you have got to understand how to do a good discovery of the client or mm -hmm. whoever is giving you the data request. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to communicate effectively. You need to be able to use your business skills to persuade someone um, to use your data and make a difference, right? Make a decision. Mm -hmm. So you often realize that the, the hardest parts are sometimes not technical. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times it's actually, again, the soft and business skills. Okay. And uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the head of the insights team, which means that you manage people as well? Uh, yes. So we have a team of about 16 um, mm -hmm. across like different countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Bangalore, um, Sydney as well. So I assume uh, a lot of uh, the soft skills come into that as well? Yes, and you know, cultural differences, mm -hmm. um, how do you approach um, clients or even team members in, in different teams and different geos? Um, all these are important learning points. 
Okay. We have more questions. Uh, Charmaine asks, are there any personal challenges and how do you deal with it? Like if you are not learning fast enough, so how do you uh, deal with your own self-growth, I guess? Yep. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real challenge, uh, mm -hmm. not learning fast enough. Like I said, things are speeding past. You know, you've got millions of people globally just coming up with um, newer Python packages and uh, newer ways of analyzing things. You can't keep on top of them, um, but you can try your best. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and I think one of it is just talking to more people in the industry, um, really just reading different articles, mm -hmm. um, getting yourself up to speed on what's happening in the industry is so important here. Okay, uh, we have another question from HP. Uh, how does it feel to be working in one of the most well-known companies in the world? It's, it's funny because I, I've never felt that. Um, mm -hmm. And it could be because I joined LinkedIn uh, when they first started in Singapore. And I remember, because I was doing sales at that time, and you would kind of make cold calls to companies. Um, and often people would be like, what is this company? Like, is it Link LinkedIn? Um, how do I spell <laughs> it? And you go to receptionist, and again, like they wouldn't know this company. So I came from kind of that time uh, and that era. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, now LinkedIn is a lot more well-known. Um, but I've never felt like, you know, we're still we are one of the most well-known companies. It is today. Um, but, you know, we, we try to keep humble. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go back to one of the questions that were, you know, uh, more coding related. How do you prevent confirmation bias when analyzing the data from Zachary? <laughs> yep. Um, first, I think you got to, you can, you can get very attached, uh, emotionally attached to your analysis. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that's where it's coming from. And sometimes um, it's personal stake as well, right? I mean, an analyst could have spent six months working on a hypothesis. And if it doesn't turn out true, like they feel like, you know, their performance evaluation maybe may have taken a step back. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are many answers to this. One is that we must be kind of um, embracing of failures, uh, embracing of testing. And that needs to be built into the corporate culture. Mm -hmm. um, easier said than done, um, mm -hmm. but it has to be led from the top. People, has got, people have got to know that it's okay, right? It's okay for a certain analysis to take a longer time or mm -hmm. to disprove your hypothesis and so on. And then of course, there is also getting um, like a more diverse council of people to advise on projects, making sure that we're not blindsided or just taking, you know, charge of, uh, taking care of one perception. And this is especially important, um, not just confirm confirmation bias, but just bias in general. Think about it, like um, it depends on what you're solving for as well. So mm -hmm. imagine if today I build an algorithm on LinkedIn, right? And I'm trying to increase engagement, which means that I want to try to increase uh, people clicking on a job. Mm -hmm. And that, could, that algorithm could build bias because then we just have people um, who are qualified to actually click apply and recruiters will view them. And then this self-serving cycle keeps going on and on. And yeah. what happens to people who are less connected but mm -hmm. are still qualified for it, um, just that they may not have the official qualifications. So you need, you need to have a diverse council of people to actually advise on projects as well. Okay. It's, it's, uh, you mentioned the word diversity quite often. You also mentioned uh, the culture. How is the culture at LinkedIn? I mean, I, I love it. Um, and I know uh, most people who have left LinkedIn come back to say that this is still the best company they've ever worked at. Um, it really boils down to very clear, you know, culture and value um, statements that we have. And we mm -hmm. live by them every day. Um, things like, you know, culture, um, sorry, things like humor, transformation. These are things that we embrace uh, in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, values like relationships matter, um, integrity, act like an owner. Everybody knows this by heart. And mm -hmm. it's, it's quite comforting when, you know, you go for every company or hands or meetings and the leaders talk about decisions or, or award people based on these cultural, cultural value tenets. Okay. So it's consistent throughout the, the company, it sounds like. It is. Yeah. So uh, everybody keep the questions coming in. Uh, how about, uh, so you work with ASEAN, does that make you, I mean, pre-COVID obviously, but uh, does that keep you only in this area or do you travel beyond, beyond this uh, locale? Yep. Um, so definitely we travel across Asia Pac, uh, mostly to like Bangalore, Sydney, Hong Kong, uh, sometimes Tokyo to meet clients. Mm -hmm. um, but I would travel to kind of San Francisco um, mm -hmm. to visit like different cross-functional partners, uh, different teams in our headquarters as well. Okay, great. 
So if anybody, if you guys have any more questions about the, the work or school related, keep them coming. Uh, okay, I would like to go on to, you know, more about you personally. So you, you mentioned a few times, you know, you wouldn't mind taking uh, like drama classes. Uh, you enjoyed your time over, uh, while you were uh, traveling overseas in the U.S. Uh, what do you do on your free not working time? Is it all work for you? No, definitely not. Um, I, I have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. So definitely spending, and I want to spend more time with them, uh, especially on the weekends and at nights. Um, I've just started taking tennis lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I can play decently, um, very amateurishly, but still kind of learning a new sport, um, which is COVID friendly. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is great. Yeah, so kind of learning new things uh, every now and then, reading books, uh, mm -hmm. watching a bit of Netflix, and definitely spending a lot more time with family if I can. Okay. So you, you, you mentioned uh, COVID. Has uh, COVID uh, changed uh, your life quite a bit? Massively. Um, mm -hmm. So starting from, you know, when, when COVID first hit, um, the kids had to take Zoom classes at home. And, you know, Zoom classes don't really work for three to five-year-old kids. Um, yeah. You had to kind of babysit them um, throughout the whole lesson. Um, now they're back at uh, preschool, so it's much better. Mm -hmm. But um, my wife and I, uh, my wife is a finance manager at a pharmaceutical company. So both of us are working from home. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of a new reality for us. And when you work from home, it, it, sound, it sounds kind of like nice and sexy, you know. But I think after a while, the, the boundaries between like work and personal life um, gets blurred a little. So mm -hmm. sometimes we do need to kind of motivate ourselves or just, you know, break the cycle and engage ourselves once in a while. Okay. Has any uh, good come from this new situation? Yeah, I think it's just adapting to it. Um, mm -hmm. And adapting to it also means that I've, I've grown, um, I've managed to find time to do more mm -hmm. stuff that I want to do. Um, okay. So setting really like clear boundaries uh, at certain times and I'll go for a run um, to make sure I reset my mind for the evening. Mm -hmm. um, so you get more time to do like running, learning and so on. Um, that's great. Okay. So you do, you run, you play tennis. Uh, and we have a question. Uh, do you have a lot of time for uh, self-learning for your job? Uh, and do you do it after the working hours? Right. Um, so do I have a lot of learning to do? Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. and self-learning is in many different categories, right? Um, mm -hmm. so I would have to learn obviously some of the technical stuff, um, different Python packages, and then on the non-technical stuff, um, leadership is a really, really big topic where mm -hmm. you can never finish learning, uh, different scenarios requires different kinds of learning. For example, if, uh, I think when I first became a leader, uh, there was massive hiring to do, I guess we were growing the business. So I had to go for, um, kind of online lessons on understanding like what kind of questions people ask, what to look up for and so on. And at every stage of your leadership cycle, there'll be always something uh, new to learn, right? Mm -hmm. But it's change management uh, or influencing um, people at higher authorities. So yes, a lot of learning to do, never enough time to learn. Um, it's about how you manage your time. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. And Lenny actually has the perfect question. Is there any advice you would give to your younger self and everybody else here tuning in? Right. Um, really profound question. It see. is, yes. <laughs> I would say the biggest advice I'll give myself um, is that confidence um, mm -hmm. is actually the difference. It makes a whole lot of difference. I, at every stage of my career, you know, I would always find myself in a situation where do you take an intelligent risk and go big, even though you may not seem qualified or experienced enough for it, right? Or, you know, stick to the safe ground and say, all right, I'm going to maybe apply for this job or I'm going to take on this project because I know uh, I have shown that I can do it. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the people who grow really fast in their career trajectory are those who take the risk. And it means that, you know, seemingly unqualified and not as experienced, they go for it and they do a good job out of it. Mm -hmm. so, the ability to really instill this confidence in yourself and pursue those bigger dreams mm -hmm. uh, will actually literally set the trajectory of your career. So are you advocating to take risks? Um, take intelligent risks, mm -hmm. but also kind of, um, you know, gain the confidence, um, instill that confidence in yourself. It's important. Do you have any specific advice to how to instill that confidence? 
Um, you know what? Finally, I I think I can build on my own confidence as well. Um, mm-hmm. But I recently met uh, one of the sales leaders in my company, and she she mentioned that she also has a board of advisors mm-hmm. that constantly remind her how great she is, reminds her of the great things she has done. Um, you know, close confidence that would infuse that confidence in you when you need it. Mm-hmm. So surround yourself by with positive positive positivity and positive people. Yeah. Okay. On that note. Thank you so much for your time, Alvin. This was, yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's uh, we're here, and you obviously had a uh, interesting journey in your career, and it looks like you're probably ahead of it as well. And uh, yeah, and I hope uh, the people here who tuned tuned in can be inspired to learn, and maybe some we have we have some curious people on the coding and analyst front, so you may we may get some questions about that later on as well. Okay, uh, just before I log off, next week we have Dr. Lai Junshu. He's a healthcare futurist. Uh, essentially, he works with palliative care. Uh, these are care for people who are in their uh, their late years. Essentially, they are work- waiting to peacefully pass out and pass on. Okay, I hope you guys can tune in. Uh, if you go to the chat, there should be the login information as well. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.